Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Computer History Museum. I'm John Holler, the CEO, and on behalf of the trustees and everybody here at the museum, it's a real pleasure to welcome you today to this uh, really interesting lunchtime event. And we're very fortunate to have with us someone who has been a leading thinker, uh, and not only a thinker, but a doer, in the field of pushing computer technology out to its outer limits. Justin Ratner, who's the vice president of Intel, the chief technology officer, he is uh, head of Intel Labs and an Intel Senior Fellow. He's been working in advanced computing and high performance computing for a great deal of his career. Justin was involved with that famous uh, Department of Energy computer in the 90s, which uh, was the first to sustain a teraflop. And he's doing a, a great deal of very important work with Intel today, not only in, in that sort of pushing the envelope in computing, but also bringing it home to consumer technology, to consumer electronics, and Intel's continuing push into that area. And he's going to talk to us today about this very provocative topic of man and machine, uh, the merger, the surpassing uh, of human capability to reason, uh, real futuristic stuff. And so we're delighted to have Justin here for a, an informal conversation with Kate Green, who is the information technology editor at the MIT Technology Review. So they're going to come up on stage. They're going to have an informal conversation. You've got question cards in your seats. Please write your questions down as, uh, down as they occur to you. We'll collect those cards, give them to Kate, and you'll have a chance to ask uh, Justin about some of his more provocative ideas about the future. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Kate Green and Justin Ratner. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks. Well, hi, Justin. Hi, Kate. How are you doing? Pretty good. good. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. I've um, been really excited for this conversation ever since I was approached by the Computer History Museum and Intel because it is provocative, man and machine. And you've mm -hmm. been talking about it now for a little while, not too long, but it's, it's kind of exciting to hear someone who's in the trenches of the technology talk about the possibilities 40 years out. So. And, and the possibilities are, make a lot of people really excited and they make some people really nervous. So right. that, that makes it all the more interesting to have mm -hmm. this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but I just thought I'd kick it off with the first question, the basic question. How do you define the singularity? Well, we've, um, you know, I think we've tried to simplify the, the discussion, I, perhaps for, uh, you know, general, general consumption, um, and there, you know, there are at least sort of three different uh, definitions that, that I've seen, but, um, you know, we just, you know, we described it simply as the point at which uh, machine intelligence equals human intelligence, and, uh, uh, you know, sort of at that point, uh, you know, the machines uh, are smart enough to start d designing themselves and, and improving themselves, and, and, you know, you see this rapid departure, uh, you know, or rapid advancement of machine uh, intelligence at, uh, at that point. When you think about human intelligence and machine intelligence, what, how do you equate the two? What, what, what are the measures that you're using well, there? I mean, that's, yeah, there, that's a tough question. Though. Yeah, there, you, know, there, you know, there are lots of, you know, historical measures, Turing tests and, you know, things of, things of that sort. Um, but, you know, I think in practical terms, uh, and, and I think from, from um, the point of view of sort of what are the what are the more you know commercial opportunities uh, you know we you know we think about um, you know machines really um, you know taking on many you know everyday tasks uh, and being able to uh, you know at least uh, you know in the in the nearer term um, you know uh, perhaps uh, uh, do things like emptying the dishwasher that seems to be a, a favorite um, Target application for our uh, for our researchers, 
Um, and something simple like that actually requires an exceptional amount of intelligence. You know, it sounds simple at, at first blush, but um, you know, uh, these machines have to you know plan and navigate themselves. They have to be. Um, this is going to sound strange, but you know, they have to be comfortable working around humans. Uh, <laughs> in the sense that? that you know humans are, are unpredictable, and you're very likely to encounter an, a, a human, you know, in the path between mm -hmm. your current location and the dishwasher. To stay with that, um, and then you know when you get to the dishwasher, then it's you know odd shaped objects in arbitrary uh, position, and um, you know and and uh, the the need either to um, see with great with great precision, you know, with with human level performance, or rely on other modalities in order to, you know, grasp the objects and, and remove them without breaking them and so forth. So uh, the estimates are kind of like around 2050 or something like that, right? Yeah, I, you know, I, I've, I've tried not to, you know, not to speculate on, you know, on the, act, on the, on the intercept points. I mean, I, you know, and I've seen things as, you know, as close, as close in as 2020, right. you know, and as, and as far out as, as 2050. Um, when, um, well, last year, I guess we had another anniversary. Intel had its, uh, its 40th anniversary last year, and, and that's kind of what, what got this whole conversation going. Um, you know, uh, most people were looking back over Intel's history, and, uh, and I just said, well, I just said, okay, there are probably enough people looking back. Um, you know, how about looking forward? I mean, what's the next 40 years? And, and the singularity became, you know, in some sense, an organizing principle for that that whole uh, conversation, but one that I thought was appropriate because I, I, I did have, uh, you know, at least some sense that, um, that there was a real possibility in that, in that interval of time that, you know, we'd hit that, that point uh, of where, you know, machines and humans had, had comparable uh, intelligence. And, and then the discussion moved to more, well, okay, you know, what's happening in the near term that's gonna, mm -hmm. gonna carry us to that point in the future? Um, well, you described a scenario of a robot emptying the dishwasher, yeah. um, but I'm kind of wondering, that, that seems to me to be something that can happen in like a piecewise fashion. So we're going to see pieces of it here and there, but when we talk about a singularity, we think of a point when things really do shift. Uh, what's that going to look like and feel like? What do you think? Well, again, I, you know, I think, um, and, and this maybe gets to sort of one of the, you know, the underlying notions. Um, in the whole in the whole discussion, which is um, the fact that that technological pro progress is actually accelerating, and I think most people have you know more of a linear view. Um, you know, I I, uh, I think you know if you tend to look at you know the way history explains technological progress. It's um, uh, you know it it tends to be. Uh, you know, as a series of points on some timeline, you know, telegraph, telephone, you know, television, you know, so forth. And we think of those as sort of widely separated and somewhat disconnected events. Um, but I think, as, you know, as John was suggesting, um, you know, in his opening comments, um, in fact, um, it's, it's really a continuous process and, um, and one that gets faster every year. And so, I, you know, I, if you you know if you project out uh, in time, uh, the rate of progress is going to be so high, uh, right? People often talk about you know the next hundred years uh, um, having you know enjoying the technological progress or experiencing it may be enjoyable it may not be enjoyable depending on your <laughs> point of view, but the next hundred years of progress equaling the last twenty thousand years of, of progress and of course all of, you know. Uh, all of what we know of, you know, in terms of human technology, um, you know, is probably encompassed in that period or slightly. I guess they just discovered this 35,000-year-old musical instrument. Um, and, you know, so maybe it pushes it back a little further. But, um, boy, if the next 100 years has the progress we've seen over the last 20,000, 30,000 years, and that, you know, that's really, um, that's really extraordinary. So, um, it, you know, it may come up on us so fast that, you know, I mean, we're not, you know, really prepared for it. I mean, it, it you know, it's kind of, hey, you'll wake up one morning and, uh, you know, something will, you know, flash on the wall or holographically in front of your eyes and, you know, and declare the singularity. <laughs> uh, it may be just as, as unexpected as that. But, I mean, that's not to say 
it's a sure thing. There's a tremendous amount of ground uh, to cover. Um, I know when I, when I um, was coming in to run microprocessor research at, at Intel, uh, I was talking to our team in, uh, in Beijing uh, who, was, who was doing uh, speech recognition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they gave a very nice overview of what they were doing. And, you know, and I said, I'm, I'm just curious, what's the relationship between microprocessor performance and speech recognition accuracy? And, you know, and there was silence, and I went, oh, gee, we've lost the line to Beijing, you know, typical thing, you know. And, uh, you know, and, and I said, you guys still there? Uh-huh. I said, well, you know, are you going to answer my question? Yeah, there really isn't a direct relationship between microprocessor performance and speech recognition accuracy. Uh, and, you know, and we went on to discuss the fact that the algorithmic approaches that were, you know, popular then, um, and I think, you know, to some extent still popular now, um, really had, you know, inherent performance limitations and, and were unlikely, um, uh, you know, in, the, in and of themselves to achieve human recognition accuracy. And I think the challenge remains uh, that, you know, many, um, many of the tasks we equate with human, you know, performance uh, are be beyond our, our algorithmic base, uh, you know, our, our programming know-how, if you will, at this point, um, and are really among the biggest challenges in getting to that, in getting to that point. It's almost like, I, I, I'm sure the hardware will be there once we figure out what we need to do. That's kind of, that's kind of the assumption, isn't it? Moore's Law keeps marching on. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to hear you say that about software. What do you see from your vantage point, the most promising um, advanced software that could um, help, help make speech recognition better, image recognition. I mean, is it, is it really about the software or is it about data sets, training? Well, I, I think what we've seen over the last decade is, um, you know, is a, you know, is a growing base of understanding um, around uh, statistical or probabilistic <clears throat> computing techniques. Uh, I think what people, you know, love about, um, about uh, Google and, you know, and search in Google, uh, you know, is the, is the fact that, you know, there's, there's a, an underlying statistical or probabilistic base, you know, of that, of that approach. Um, and, and you see it in sort of obvious and not so obvious ways. I mean, I think the, you know, the did you mean you know, whatever the string is, right, mm -hmm. is an indication that, that the recognition engine, um, you know, is going beyond sort of what we, what we think of as the, you know, sort of the traditional search engine, which, you know, says, you know, query not recognized or something mm -hmm. like that, right? The Google engine is, is trying, much as a human would try to understand your, you know, query, did you mean this, did you mean that? And in so many other areas, when I look at vision and speech um, and, um, and these other, uh, these other perceptual uh, tasks, um, you know, more and more we're turning to, you know, statistical techniques, machine learning techniques, as, as, they call, as they're called. And I think therein will, you know, I believe we'll find the, the, the path to um, building machines with, with human level performance. So let's talk about Moore's Law for a little bit. This is something <laughs> that Intel is kind of, I mean, this is the foundation, right? And uh, it, it looks a lot different than it did 10 years ago, right now. Mm -hmm. um, how, how has it changed in the past 10 years, even five years? Well, for, um, you know, for us, uh, speaking you know, for, for Intel, um, you know, it, I think it's really changed, uh, it's really changed a lot. And it, in fact, um, you know, if you think about this, the recent transition to uh, high K metal gate, uh, you know, transistor architectures, um, you know, we, we essentially, you know, came to the end of, uh, of the road with respect to the classic silicon gate MOS transistor. Um, you know, the, the, um, uh, the silicon dioxide insulating layer in the, in the transistor uh, was just getting too thin and, you know, there was too much leakage. Uh, we were looking at, you know, some of our processor designs where leakage power was equal to operating power. Uh, and, and so something had to, something had to change. So, um, you know, whether you look back 10 years or 40 years, things had been 
unbelievably stable. I mean, we just, you know, we just kept applying the scaling rules, and you know, with advances uh, in, you know, in processing technology, we were able to drive that, you know, that transistor architecture down to, um, you know, a very fine, uh, fine pitch. But we got to the point where, you know, we really couldn't practically um, push it any further, um, and. Amazingly, and I mean, and I don't think there was nearly enough sort of appreciation, of, you know, of how um, deftly that transition took place from you know from silicon gate to you know high K metal gate. I mean, literally, not you know not a month was you know was lost in terms of the you know of the um, you know the the regular pace of Moore's law. So, you know, huge transition from a transistor architecture point of view, uh, but one that was just sort of slipped in uh, without too much, you know, too much notice and, you know, and now we'll be running for some period of, of time on that, you know, with that new transistor architecture. But there's a sense that, um, that I think, you know, there are a number of, of rapid changes that will take place. Uh, um, you know, uh, even in as little as, you know, the next uh, three or four years. Um, because, um, you know, it's not, I mean, it's, while high K is, is great, it's, you know, it's not uh, sort of the end of, you know, of Moore's Law. It's, you know, in some sense, the beginning of a, you know, of a new phase of Moore's Law. So, transistors are still shrinking. Um, they're not getting as fast. That stopped a while back. Um, but we're looking at more power savings. This is, is kind of like a shift of focus. But... Talk to me about like five years from now, ten years from now, and how is that going to play a part in this this um, human machine intelligence convergence? Well, you know, I think you know we expect uh, you know the the transistor budgets to continue to grow, um, and in fact, uh, you know what Gordon predicted, um, you know, many many years ago uh, was in fact that the that the number of transistors right. were, would grow. He didn't say anything about performance, uh, there, although there was obviously an implication to performance, and he didn't say anything about power. Um, and you know, I think um, I think we see um, we see as far uh, I think into the future uh, in terms of Moore's law. You know, and that's and that's typically you know clearly out about three generations, and then somewhat you know more vaguely out you know another another couple of generations beyond that. So. Um, you know, it, it looks very much like it has looked, and you know, I think you know, if, if you'd asked, you'd walked up to um, you know an Intel process technologist, you know, ten years ago, they would have said um, you know said the same same thing. But um, but clearly, we're now being uh, you know we're much more subject to constraints on on power, um, and it's not as though the transistors aren't you know aren't faster. I mean, they, you know, I mean they have higher FTs, and you know, and they. Uh, and on an individual basis, uh, you know, lower energies. I mean, all sort of the traditional benefits. But, um, but you know, if you put enough of them down on a piece of silicon and run them all at you know full tilt, um, you know, you have you have a, a power um, challenge. And so, so now we're we're sort of shifting in our mindset from from devoting transistors simply to making things, you know, go faster uh, to spending transistors uh, to reduce power consumption, you know, and, and to improve the, the energy efficiency. And I think, I mean, we're definitely, I think we're, we're there to stay in some sense uh, unless some future technology, you know, sort of resets all the numbers. Some future, te some future technology, like? Well, you know, I think, um, you know, we're to the point now where we're even, you know, we're even looking beyond charge-based electronics. Uh, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's a challenge for any technology to outperform, uh, you know, CMOS uh, in terms of, uh, you know, its performance and efficiency and, and of course, uh, uh, you know, being able to, you know, take full advantage of the manufacturing um, uh, infrastructure that you know that surrounds it, but um, you know at some point uh, you know we're going to have to look beyond charge-based electronics, and people are starting to look at uh, spin and other quantum effects, um, and you know other materials. A lot of you know a lot of attention being paid to graphene uh, at the moment, 
um, I think as we explore sort of the you know carbon uh, based approaches nanotubes and uh, and other sorts of things so um, you know I, I think if for Moore's law to uh, you know continue well into the future um, I think it's reasonable to anticipate um, you know uh, a move off of charge at some point maybe that's a decade or you know or a decade and a half into the future uh, and and you know onto some of the, you know some other quantum effect or maybe a mix of charge and non charge um, you know kinds of kinds of systems but um, uh, you know, I think there's, there's, there's still a lot of cheese down that, that tunnel, and people who, you know, talk about the, you know, the end of Moore's Law um, are, are not on very stable ground, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> All right. Um, so tell me what you think human-computer interfaces are going to look like in this interim between uh, now and yeah. um, the singular. Well, you know, I think, uh, you know, we... we we're exploring a number of, uh, of directions in, you know, in, uh, in our labs. Um, you know, rather than just sort of jump to some interesting modality here, let, let me just say um, that um, I think one of, the, you know, one of the big changes that, that's coming relatively soon is this notion of context awareness. Um, that you know, these machines will become, you know, uh, you know, much more aware of their surroundings, much more aware of, of the, the humans that they're, that they're interacting with. You know, they'll understand, you know, likes and dislikes. And, you know, and just routine stuff. I mean, you know, uh, what's the calendar like today? Uh, you know, am I driving to the office or am I driving to the airport? You know, I'm gonna just, when I think about, you know, the decision I make when I, you know, come out of my driveway, right? Um, Unfortunately, too often I'm driving to the airport as opposed to the office. But uh, you know, I think that that sense of you know where they are in space and time and, and who they're interacting with, um, by the way, is going to be I think one of the important first steps to making us feel like we're dealing with machines of some intelligence. Uh, I was interviewing some someone um, a few months ago. Um, and we were, you know, we were on this, this, um, this topic, and they said, you know, my iPhone doesn't know any more about me than it did the day I bought it. And I, I was really struck by that, by that comment. And I think, I think that, that, that addressed itself to exactly to this issue of, you know, how do we make these machines much more aware of who we are and, and, and what we do? Um, and, you know that will drive, uh, I think, the you know the the human interface um, development, and there and there are very exciting things there. I mean, um, you know, at IDF last fall, we had um, uh, you know we had the you know the folks from Emotive, you know, putting on these the headgear that was reading out brain waves. Uh, we've done Did some. You try it? No, I didn't. I didn't try it. I have to admit, I didn't. I didn't try it. We we. I had a chance we, we had to try experts it out. do it. Yeah, experts. <laughs> I had a chance to try it out, and it's pretty fun. But I can't imagine playing a game and then suddenly <laughs> focusing on um, moving a brick. But you know, um, you know, other things. So uh, you know, we've done our Seattle labs uh, worked with the University of Washington folks on on these neural uh, wisps, as we as we call them, um, that can be implanted and provide you know direct uh, connection to um, to the neural. Pathways, and I have no doubt, you know, that will continue to uh, advance and and evolve. So, um, you know, whether it's direct communication with, um, you know, with our brains, or it's just, you know, utilizing our, you know, our, our various senses, and you know, we've seen <clears throat> how, you know, how well touch has done, uh, you know, with the with the iPhone and and you know, and other products in in terms of, you know, making a, a much more uh, human-friendly interface, and I think we're going to see, you know, more of those, uh, you know, sorts of uh, sorts of things. There's, there's just, I mean, there's just much more to come along that line. Right, the context-aware stuff, mm -hmm. the the neural interfaces. Sorry about this. Let's see. I think you're okay. <clears throat> all right. So, um, what role does parallel computing play in all of this, and what are the challenges there, at bandwidth, and and then programming it? Well, 
Yeah, I, I, having worked in the in the field for a long time, uh, you know, we uh, and we, you know, we were focused, you know, primarily at, at the at the very high end kind of computing problems. The uh, you know the grand challenges, you know, climate modeling and and uh, you know uh, safeguarding the nuclear stockpile uh, and other you know and other sorts of uh, and other sorts of things. But as I think as as we began to you know fully comprehend the the significance of the power challenge, uh, we began to you know realize that uh, just pushing the serial performance of microprocessors um, um, you know ever upward uh, was going to be was going to be very difficult that the, you know the power levels just made it you know prohibitive uh, and that's why you see you know you see clock frequency in particular uh, has really has really plateaued uh, you know in the last uh, in the last few years and and so that uh, you know that that in some sense, Led to uh, you know a sort of a, a rekindling of interest in you know in parallel uh, technology. Uh, you know Moore's law had had managed to sort of keep it at at bay, and even within you know academic research circles, you know a lot of the people that had worked in parallel computing in the 70s and 80s had sort of gone on to to other things. But um, as it really appears to be one of the fundamental. Uh, design approaches to driving performance yet staying within um, the power budgets, uh, it, um, it's garnering a lot, a lot more attention. And, and um, you know, John Hennessy, you know, at Stanford says, you know, this is, you know, the, the greatest challenge for, you know, computing or computer science, uh, you know, of, you know, sort of uh, the modern era. So, um, I think we all agree that it's going to it's going to play a critical role. But many of the classic challenges remain, which is you know um, we've yet to develop the programming tools um, and and programming techniques that's going to let you know the you know the ordinary programmer um, to um, you know to express a problem in a way that uh, you know through some degree of automation is, is going to you know produce a well performing. <laughs> Program and um, you know while there's been you know a number of interesting developments, my opinion is we you know we still have some distance uh, to go. Intel uh, you know funded these two um, uh, you know parallel computing research uh, centers at Berkeley and uh, at Illinois, uh, and and you know it's, it's trying to encourage the the academic community to really go after these problems, and it consumes a lot of our internal research. Uh, cycles, uh, you know, attempting to, um, you know, create those those new tools. But I, you know, I think everybody agrees that that parallelism is is one of the fundamental techniques. Uh, but um, we've got to crack the programming problem if it's going to be uh, widely deployed. Do you see any um, likely candidates so far? Is it still too early? You think? Well, I mean, there are. Um, you know, there are various things out there. I think, uh, you know, I think on the data parallel side, um, you know, we see some of the low-level languages uh, like CUDA and OpenCL um, as, you know, as providing, um, uh, I think, you know, useful um, expression uh, um, mechanisms for, you know, for data parallelism. We're working, at Intel, we're working on, a, on quite a higher-level tool we call CT. Uh, for data parallel uh, computing that um, uh, uses a, a nested vector construct, which is very, very powerful and lets you uh, express both regular and irregular parallel computations. Um, and interestingly enough, it, its back end uh, is designed to target uh, either, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Sort of accelerated, uh, you know, uh, vector operations, or target, uh, you know, mainstream microprocessors, and even decide sort of how much to run on the on the you know conventional processor and how much to run uh, on one of these um, you know vector intensive uh, architectures. Um, but there, you know, there's other stuff underway. Uh, um, you know, some I can't, you know, I can't talk about, but uh, you know, there. Uh, I think they're um, they're definitely moving uh, towards uh, being able to mix uh, more control-based parallelism and 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 uh, and data 
parallelism uh, and, um, and handle a lot of the housekeeping details for the programmer. Yeah, what about bandwidth issues with that? Uh, uh, well, I mean, you know, bandwidth, uh, you know, isn't, uh, you know, isn't going away. I don't think there's any, you know, there's any simple, um, you know, there's any simple solution, but um, we're, uh, you know, we're looking at, um, at techniques, uh, you know, really more, you know, packaging techniques to uh, enable a lot more memory to be provisioned, um, you know, very close to the processor complex, I mean, that, that collection of, uh, of cores, um, and looking at, at very low power interfaces for doing that. I mean, if you look at sort of conventional memory these days, DDR, you know, two, three, uh, and even four, um, they, they require a tremendous amount of, uh, of power. And, um, and we're looking at both electrical as well as optical techniques for interfacing to memory that would be an order of magnitude or several orders of magnitude lower uh, in power. And the optical one, um, you know, I'm especially in, in, intrigued with because while, uh, you know, it, it sort of, you know, it's, it's feasible, I guess, to package, you know, a lot more memory close to the processor and do it at lower power. Um, from an industrial design point of view, that's not always the best thing, and, you know, and, a, and an optical solution would allow us to push that memory further away without paying a, a latency penalty to, um, to do that. And, and uh, you know, I think, you know, optical, I mean, we're sort of coming back to this notion of singularity, I think, you know, optical is, is one of those technologies that if we can move it into sort of the Moore's Law mo model, this, no this notion of, you know, accelerating returns, um, we could really see some, some spectacular advancements because, you know, when, once you're moving photons, um, you know, you're almost unlimited in terms of the, in terms of the bandwidth and, um, you know, and that, if we can make that transition at a price we can all afford, um, I think the, the potential is just huge. Right. So what other technologies, um, aside from Moore's Law or the photonic technologies, do you see um, with accelerating returns that will play a part in the singularity? Well, there, you know, I think what, what, we've, what we've started to do over the last, let's say, you know, half dozen years is, is look at how um, we can, you know, we can move more of these technologies, you know, uh, into a Moore's Law-like model, right? Um, radios, um, which are going to be extremely important. Uh, you know, we're not going to have all these, you know, robots running around with, you know, Cat 5 coming out of them. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know, we're going to have, you know, we're going to have billions of, of devices, um, you know, connected and communicating by radio. But, but radios, you know, have never really, in, you know, enjoyed the same sorts of benefits from Moore's law th that, you know, the, you know, the computational elements or the memory elements have enjoyed. So, um, we were sort of forced by necessity at Intel. Um, you know, I don't want to bring down the, the wrath of Khan here, but, um, you know, we just, you know, on the research side, we sort of felt we're never really going to have a, you know, a great analog process. Um, you know, we may have elements of analog, but we're just, you know, we're just, it's not in our DNA. So, um, so we said, well, okay, what if we re rethought radio as a computational problem and essentially replaced all the traditional analog elements with digital elements. I mean, could we actually build a radio that had no analog components in it? And we're, and we're very close to that now. And whereas people building analog radios, you know, have, have a very hard time shrinking them, right? Digital radios scale wonderfully, just right, I mean, you know, you know, we have radios on 45 nanometer technology, or at least the building blocks for them. Um, you know, at 32 nanometers, we're going to have the complete radio, all all the pieces for it, and and we're and because it's digital, it takes full advantage of of the you know the Moore's law behavior. So that's one. 
uh, but, a, but a very important one. And, and critical of that is the ability to mix communication and computation on the same chip. Um, you know, another one um, is uh, uh, in, the, you know, in the sensing space, particularly the biosensing space. And, um, you know, there we're trying to create, you know, an entirely new class of uh, devices that um, basically, uh, you know, interface, for lack of a better term, to, you know, molecular structures. Uh, and, you know, then the possibility exists that you'll be able to, you know, directly read out the amino acids, you know, on a, you know, on a DNA chain, right? Um, and, I mean, would it be just incredible if, you know, biosensing, which is, I think is going to be an integral element in this, you know, human machine um, intelligence uh, race, uh, you know, was following a law of accelerating returns and, our, you know, our ability to sense the real world. I mean, not just, you know, DNA, but, you know, everything uh, at, you know, uh, sort of any organic molecule, uh, you know, is actually following that, you know, that law. Um, you know, we've done, some, we've done some sensor work. We have uh, uh, this project we did uh, where we put a sensor platform on, um, on a large number of the street sweepers in the city of San Francisco. Okay. You've heard about this. And, uh, you know, and everybody thought that was cool, and the environmental people said, wow, we've never had so much data. The city of San Francisco has one environmental sensor, we came to learn. And, you know, and here we're getting, you know, precision data, you know, all over the city. And, um, but when we looked at commercializing it, you know, we immediately ran into the sensor problem because the sensor in each one of those platforms is twelve, fourteen hundred dollars, something like that, right? The electronics, you know, was probably less than a hundred dollars. So, you know, clearly sensing is, you know, is a is a huge untapped opportunity for the, you know, for the IC industry, uh, and you know, and is important in bridging that gap from, you know, wetware. Uh, to you know, hardware and software. Empowering it too. That's the, I mean, if you're going to have all these sensors, they have to be powered by something. You can't just have all these little right. dead batteries around. So, well, what are you? What are no you batteries. At there? Right. <laughs> no yeah. batteries. That's our motto. Yeah. Well, I know you have a, a wireless power program mm -hmm. going on, and, and there are other. I mean, uh, people are looking at um, piezoelectrics for harvesting right. just energy in the environment, so what sort of things are Yeah, power, about? you know, I mean, power has all kinds of interesting, um, interesting dimensions to it. Um, you know, we obviously have encountered these big power problems, you know, in terms of, um, you know, building the more powerful uh, microprocessors, but, um, you know, as we get to those, you know, billions of connected devices, <clears throat> um, you know, nobody's going to be too happy replacing, you know, batteries. Uh, over whatever interval. Yeah, if anything's going to stop the singularity, it's going to be the best. It's going to be batteries. Well, yeah, will be the biggest obstacle. Um, so you know, so we've been doing, um, you know, as have others, uh, you know, various various experiments with with wireless power. Um, scavenging has been one approach. Our, our um, I talked about the neural wisp. Uh, we've done, you know, wisp stands for wireless identification and sensing platform, um, and. The wireless refers not only to the ability of the sensor to communicate wirelessly, but to be powered wirelessly. So WISPs um, uh, scavenge, you know, basically free energy, you know, radio energy, and they charge up a capacitor, you know, until they've got enough, you know, enough um, stored energy to, you know, power up the radio, take a sensor reading, you know, relay that sensor reading, uh, maybe take in some, um, you know, some new. Uh, some new programming, and then you know, go back to you know, charging up um, their um, their capacitors. Um, uh, we, along with a number of others, are actually looking at injecting radio energy uh, of some sort into the environment, um, where you know, uh, rather than just depending on you know what the cell towers or and and uh, Wi-Fi access points are putting out and, you know, and other radio sources, we actually push energy. Into the environment, and um, you know, can imagine, you know, appliances in your, you know, in your home that, uh, you know, that 
are never plugged in. I mean, they just, you know, they take their power from the, oh my gosh, from the radio environment. So we've obviously stimulated a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of interesting, interesting questions. But um, last week we had, we had research at Intel Day here at the, at the Computer History Museum. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we showed a, um, uh, a wirelessly uh, powered loudspeaker. Um, this was not the best venue for showing a wirelessly powered loudspeaker because it was so noisy. But um, you know what? Uh, what I keep asking uh, asking the, that team to do is um, is give me a, a wirelessly powered flat screen television, which I think is sort of the obvious application. You know, I just want to uh, you know you know put a few lag bolts in the in the wall, hang the display, and have no wires and you know transmit power to it as well as transmit the you know the high def TV signal. Right, or wirelessly powered electric car. I mean, that seems like a pretty. Well, I don't know about that's that I may mean, be a big ticket. One of one of the when we first talked about wireless power last year, um, one of the best emails I got was from a, a European automobile manufacturer that will go nameless, but um, and they they said, well, gee, could you? Could there be like this pad in your garage that when you pulled the car into the garage at night, you know, the thing woke up and, you know, and transmitted uh, power so you didn't actually have to plug in a plug-in vehicle, right. you just roll it over the, roll it over to pad. Um, and I said, well, how much power are we talking about? Oh, about a kilowatt. And I said, well, you know, right. you might not be able to stand within, you know, 50 feet of this thing when it turns yeah. on, but, uh, <laughs> uh, or have any, any magnetic, uh, you know, uh, you know, jewelry, uh, you know, uh, on you or something like that. But uh, we're, you know, we're sort of in the, you know, kind of in the 50 to 100 watt range. So I noticed, uh, um, you know, one of the new, um, one of the new flat screen TVs, LED backlit TV is now under 100 watts. So, um, so, you know, I, I told the, I told the team, I said, okay, 100 watts we can do, let's, let's do the TV. Gotcha. So I'm going to start going through some of these. Um, I like this one a lot because it's talking about um, the developments that we'll expect to see five or ten years before machines achieve human level intelligence. So that's kind of a, an interesting timeline because it's, it's actually maybe five years would be better. And then like if we're talking about accelerating returns, like right up to that point. Mm -hmm. but. Um, the end of this question is, in other words, what are some early warning signs? And I think that that's probably mm -hmm. the question. What, what's it going to look like right before this happens? Well, I, you know, I, I think it comes back to what I was talking about earlier. I, I, you know, I think we, um, these, these everyday you know, sensing and, and, and perception uh, tasks, um, you know, and I think, and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll just come to expect it. I mean, you know, it, it, it won't be so novel um, that, um, you know, that, that machines are, let's say, uh, you know, at the level of, uh, you know, 95, maybe 98 percent accuracy, 95 to 98 percent of the time. Um, I, I think, you know, anybody who's worked in this field knows that, um, you know, until you get into, you know, the high 90s uh, in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of accuracy, and I'm, and I'm assuming, you know, the performance is there. I mean, you know, that if it's speech recognition, we're doing it in, in real time, but, you know, at very high accuracy. Until you get to those levels, uh, it's very clearly, uh, you know, non-human performance. So I think it's in the in, in really those everyday perceptual tasks that you know that will tell us we're getting we're getting very close now, you know the robots, you know that that we'll build using that that, you know, that sensing and perception technology, um, you know will also begin to display this you know human-like performance in, t in terms of planning and navigation and being able to uh, deal with arbitrary um, uh, environments. Um, I just have to say it's, it's a bit off the question, but it's, uh, I found a very, very entertaining idea, uh, and that's social networking for robots. Um, and yeah, and I mean, it sounds kind of, you know, but, um, you know, we were saying, well, you know, um, like how, how would your kitchen robot, um, you know, learn to run your food processor? 
right? Well, of course, every kitchen robot could learn to run your new food processor mm -hmm. um, if it didn't have it built in, but that's another story. Um, and, um, and we said, well, gee, you know, once a robot learned how to run the processor, it could teach all the other robots how to run the food processor. And so this notion of social networking sort of, you know, uh, comes to mind where, you know, all of a sudden the robots are, you know, are sort of having their own conversation. Gee, did you see this new, I don't know, who's the popular, you know, Cuisinart or something, you know, did you see the, the latest model, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, one just landed in my kitchen, and you know, and uh, you know, I, I read the manual. I read the manual online, and you know, played with it a little bit, and you know, and here's what I. So when when robots are actively networking with with one another, I mean that I think that's another you know telltale sign that the the singularity is near. Robots networking. That's the early warning sign. That's good. So. Um, what did we learn from the AI predictions and efforts of 20 years ago? <laughs> but this is a much harder problem. Um, and then, you know, that, that, you know, comes back to my, you know, my question about speech recognition performance. Um, you know, I, this, uh, you know, th this is, um, you know, this is, you know, this, this idea of, uh, you know, driving machine intelligence to human performance levels is, you know, is incredibly challenging. I, um, and, and as I said, I think it, you know, it's, it's largely, uh, you know, an algorithmic uh, problem. We may, in fact, um, you know, develop uh, solutions and quite good solutions that are, in fact, quite different than what, you know, humans and, and animals in general rely on for, uh, for uh, intelligence. But, um, uh, but I think it... You know, it's it's as likely that in that you know that interval, the next twenty to forty years, um, that we begin to understand the fundamental operating principles of the the biological mechanisms. I mean, you've got people like Jeff Hawkins, you know, up the you know uh, up the the Bay Shore here uh, at places like Numenta. Uh, you know, looking at these biologically inspired, um, you know, information processing techniques. And, um, you know, it, it may turn out that there's this larger family of, of you know, fundamentally probabilistic uh, algorithms, one of which has emerged as a result of natural selection to be the favored one for, you know, for biological uh, intelligence. So. Um, you know, whether, you know, we sort of come in from the outside or, you know, um, uh, or, um, you know, just, um, you know, gain the understanding of how, you know, how, how the biological um, uh, forms um, actually carry out the, these tasks, I think we'll, um, you know, we'll crack that, that nut. But it's, you know, it's enormously challenging. As a technologist, what are the ethical challenges? What sort of ethics do you think about in building these technologies? Yeah, I've really, uh, I've, I've, I, I tried to, have, I've tried to steer clear of, of those issues in my in my public, uh, in my public remarks. I think you you characterized it, um, you know, uh, I think very accurately at the at the outset. You know, I I, I tend to feel like. Um, you know, we're kind of working in the, you know, in the trenches, and we'll leave the, you know, the uh, the social implications of it, you know, to um, you know, to the philosophers and and, and sociologists. Uh, but um, to you know, people who don't understand the technology. But you know, I think that you know that said, uh, you know, I think we, um, you know, we do. Uh, I think we do have a responsibility, as you know, as scientists, scientists and engineers, um, to, you know, you know, to understand, um, you know, the consequences of, of this work, um, and to, um, you know, make sure that that we're, you know, we're showing the, you know, the appropriate sensitivity to um, to that. I can't think of, I can't think of anything we've done, you know, quite to this point that. Um, you know, I would I would really um, have reservations about the, the social consequences, but you know they're they're ever present. Um, in fact, uh, most of the email I received when we talked about wireless power, uh, were you know uh, you know related to the health and safety mm -hmm. aspects of it. And gee, you know, if you're putting all this power, you know, I mean, people won't even you know 
buy a house if it's near a power line, right? And all of a sudden, yeah. you know, here's this, this thing putting out, um, you know, tens of watts, maybe hundreds of watts in the near future, uh, you know, and radiating your, you know, your kitchen or your, you know, your family room or something. Um, and in fact, um, you know, I mean, we had already started the process to look at exactly those effects, and, and we've been running, you know, tests, uh, you know, looking at the field strength, and uh, you know, and um, you know, uh, are we, you know, are we likely to be generating too much heat, uh, mm -hmm. you know, causing other kinds of other kinds of disturbances? So. Um, I, I think we have, uh, at least in our work, I think we have um, a fair amount of sensitivity um, to those things, but um, we'll, we'll have to be much closer to the singularity, I think, before we really begin to, And can you know, see kind of what's happening. And, yeah, and, 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 and can see it. And, you know, there's no doubt uh, that, you know, there'll be a lot of interest in, in you know, the uh, defense, you know, the military sorts of applications of these things, which will have similar concerns. Um, some of your handwriting is a little <laughs> funny. <laughs> um, so Jeff Hawkins indicates that human intelligence is very different from AI. It's a radically different approach needed to reach the singularity. Uh, well, I think I, I would agree with that to the extent um, that, well, I think traditional AI, you know, you know, rule-based systems or um, you know, or logic-based uh, systems. I, I think I think that's correct, and that's that's why I've talked about you know, the the last decade. Um, you know, has uh, you know, I think you know, uh, basically, you know, I think f from starting with Judah Pearl's you know work, I think sort of shifted us, you know, much more to this you know statistical or probabilistic. Uh, approach in you know in machine learning and and I've noticed uh, when you look in fact I was looking at one this morning you know when you look at faculty rosters now nobody well few people will admit they're you know as faculty members they're actually AI faculty um, you know you're in you know you're in machine learning or you're in biologically inspired intelligence or something like I mean it's I don't know people have sort of run away from AI. But um, uh, you know, but I mean, the the kinds of problems they're they're trying to solve, you know, are are uh, classic ones in, in artificial intelligence. The the techniques have just changed, um, you know, significantly. Well, it's about time to wrap up. And um, but I, I thought I'd just ask one more question that I saw here that I thought was interesting. <laughs> it's kind of a tough one. How do you know that the software is correct for your intelligent computer? <laughs> Well, I, actually, it's a great question, and 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 um, and in some sense, you know, statistical techniques, just just like we are, right? Um, you know, I mean, we're not a hundred percent correct, uh, right? And 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 I don't think you have to be a hundred percent on you know on any of these uh, on any of these perceptual tasks. Um, and, you know, uh, if, you know, if humans, if humans were 100 percent, maybe that it would be a, a steeper hill to climb. To climb. But, um, but I think the, you know, the move away from, you know, very deterministic forms of, of programming to, you know, statistical techniques and relying more on, you know, on learning and training, um, in, you know, in order to, you know, raise performance levels, you know, sort of sidesteps the software correctness issue. Right, and um, you know, while there are clearly going to be applications, you know, and right, the ones which have, sort of have huge consequences, like you know, um, automated driver assistance. You know, since since the DARPA, you know, Grand Challenge races, and you know, and all that stuff. You know, uh, the automakers who were initially kind of you know reluctant to get involved because they thought one of these cars was going to kill somebody. Um, thank goodness they didn't, but, um, you know, there, that possibility existed. You know, now they see all the opportunities to actually assist the, the driver and, and, and leverage that, that technology. But, um, gee, if the vision system in the vehicle uh, or the, you know, the laser ranging system, you know, doesn't spot that pedestrian or that dog and, you know, in the street, uh, you know, there's going to be, uh, I'm sure, a lot of time spent in court arguing uh, you know about about liability here, but um, but uh, you know I don't 
I guess I don't think the you know the machines should be necessarily held to a higher standard than we you know than we hold um, than we hold humans to because if we're if we're asking them to be behave you know initially in these sort of very bounded situations as we do um, you know they're going to be right some very high percentage of the time but they'll be wrong uh, you know hopefully a, m a much smaller percentage and uh, and and that has to be you know considered uh, you know as just you know part of that that advancement of, of machine intelligence yeah it seems like we're going to have to be a little bit more tolerant of machines being wrong well, and I think we will be more tolerant as they begin to exhibit, you know, many of the same behaviors and characteristics we do as humans. Interesting. Well, thank you, Justin. Right, it's thanks. been a real pleasure. I want to end uh, as a token of our thanks for being with us today. We have a very special gift. This is a book called Core Memory, oh, yeah. which is some of the best photographs of the museum taken by Mark Richards, uh, our collection downstairs, and other things from the collection. And uh, they're, they're artistic and they're also technical. Uh, nice blend for, uh, for an erudite guy like you, Justin. So please accept that with our <laughs> I've thanks. I've admired the book for a long time. Terrific. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Kate, thank you very much. Thank you.